Well, another glorious day at Hillbrook Asylum. What a fun day we just had. So, against my better judgment, I decided to hold a little group therapy session. Get a few of the patients out of their cells, let them interact with each other, share their problems. It sure sounds good. But then again, this is Hillbrook. Nothing ever quite works out the way it's supposed to here. That's why we so rarely hold group therapy sessions. It usually always ends in disaster. How are violent manic lunatics supposed to sit down and have a quiet chat with each other? That may work over at Shadow Mountain, but not over here. We get the worst of the worst. So, five patients had been picked to participate in the session. Why such a small number? Well, we foolishly hoped it would minimize any chances of unfortunate incidents. The patients were the following. Patient 471, Alice Watson, aka The Living Shadow. Patient 712, Axel Breitling, aka Pistonhead. Patient 922, Michael Blanc, aka Mr. Blank. Patient 319, Simon Silk, aka Succulent. And patient 649, Samuel Santini, aka Flatface. This is what happened. Santini had been brought in first and was strapped down to a chair. Said chair was also bolted to the floor. Besides this, he was naturally also wearing a straitjacket. The rest were then brought in, one at a time. All of them wearing straitjackets except for Blanc. He never displays any signs of violent behavior whatsoever, so the security detail is very lax around him. For safety's sake, I had five security guards in the room with me, two of them for Santini, while an additional two were posted outside. Seven guards may seem like overkill, but we probably would have needed seventeen. When all patients were seated, I sat down. We were all formed in a circle, Watson and Breitling to my right and Silk and Blanc to my left, while Santini was in front of me. Not really being suicidal, I obviously avoided staring at him. He of course kept glancing at everyone in the room, paranoid that someone must have been staring at his face. Blanc then began to rifle through his box of paper masks. He always carries this box with him wherever he goes in the asylum. It contains a mask for every conceivable mood. Eventually he picked one out and put it on. It was the smiley face. I asked him why he was feeling so chipper. He answered that it was going to be nice to have a talk with his fellow inmates. Meanwhile, Breitling had got it in his head that his chair was a car and began to make car engine noises with his mouth. Apparently he was on the freeway. I asked him how he could stare without the use of his hands, being in a straitjacket and all. His mind miles away, he simply ignored me. One of the guards then stepped up and asked me whether he should knock Breitling out. Really? Such vulgarity. I told him no and called him a barbaric brute. Let Breitling have his fantasy, maybe he'll join in later. I then turned to Watson, who was sitting next to Breitling, pointed at him and asked her, what do you make of that? Breitling made a honking noise. He's nuts, she said. Why do you say that? I asked. She made a face like the question was utterly moronic, and then answered, because he thinks a chair is a car. But you think you're a shadow, I countered. Isn't that also nuts? How are the two of you different? Now, my intentions were right, but it was still a bad move. Never tell a crazy person they're crazy, they usually don't appreciate it. Watson of course got agitated. She raised her voice and insisted firmly that she was just a shadow. Two guards stepped closer to her. I waved him off. She was upset, sure, but we still weren't experiencing an attack. Not yet, anyway. I calmed her down and told Watson to tell the group about it. Explain to them how she was just a shadow. She seemed reluctant at first, but then carefully began to open up. She wasn't human, she was a shadow entity that lived in a realm of complete darkness. However, she had somehow escaped this realm and made her way to our world. Her greatest desire was to be human and walk among us, and so she had done for a while. She even fell in love with a man and forgot what she truly was. But her brother eventually came for her. Yes, she had a brother, also a shadow entity. When she fled, she had selfishly left him all alone, all alone in the darkness. She realized how wrong that was of her, and how she didn't belong here anyway, no matter how much she wanted to. But now she's caught here, she can't return, because we won't let her. 
Watson then burst out that he was there, her brother. He was apparently in the room with us, standing in the back next to one of the guards. Blanc asked where. She pointed. He took off his smiley mask, picked up another one from the box and put it on. It was a confused mask. There's no one there, he said. Watson insisted though, and got agitated again. She claimed that her brother was now waving at her, urging her to come to him. Before I could signal for one of the guards to hold her down, she leapt off the chair and ran towards her brother. Breitling made honking noises and yelled out, and I quote, Get the hell out of the way, lady, I'm driving here, end quote. A guard caught her and dragged her back, screaming and kicking to her chair. Santini muttered, and again I quote, crazy fucking broad, end quote. After a few minutes, Watson eventually began to calm down. I then asked her to explain to the group just how she will return to this shadow realm and her brother. I have to kill myself, she said. That's the only way to get back to the darkness. Silk then interrupted, you know if it's killing yourself you want, I can gladly help you out with that. I turned to him. Oh, and how is that? Silk looked at her with hatred in his eyes. Disgusting human being, he said. You need to die like the rest of them. Watson insisted she wasn't human though. Silk didn't agree. She was human. A worthless, pathetic, vile human being. That's not a very nice thing to say, Blanc interjected. He removed his confused mask and put on the sad one. Silk told him to shut up. He would get his turn too. They all would. Even you, Doc, he said, looking me square in the eye. Santini didn't exactly like being threatened and began to yell obscenities at Silk. Silk responded in kind, but avoided looking at him. Even he understood that it's probably not that smart to stare flat face in the face. So, Silk, I started, why do you hate humans so much? You're a human yourself, after all. Or are you a mosquito? Both, he answered. There's no difference. Humans are mosquitoes. Gross insects that need to be squashed. Silk fancied himself a sort of mosquito man, and used to work at a carnival together with two other patients of ours, Piranha Boy and the Giant. Kinda weird how everyone from that carnival keeps ending up here. Anyway, I then made the point that Watson and Silk weren't really that different from one another. Their issues both stemmed from extreme low self-images, I said. Whereas Watson considered herself a non-human shadow, not worthy of socializing among real people, Silk viewed himself as a mere insect. Of course, neither of them liked hearing that. Both of them got heated again. Watson was just a shadow blah 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 blah, and Silk did not appreciate being compared to someone else. You may find this odd, but despite his self-hatred, the man also suffers from a superiority complex. How dare I compare him to one of his pathetic victims? This conflicting attitude is actually not that uncommon, even among so-called sane people. You'd be surprised how many can't decide whether they hate or love themselves. Suddenly, all attention was pulled to Breitling, as he made a loud screeching noise, like his car came to a sudden stop. Fill her up, he then said, and began to make sounds that mimicked a tank being filled up with gasoline. I have to confess it made me chuckle a bit. And not only me, but the entire room began laughing, even Silk and Santini. Blanc didn't actually laugh, of course. He removed his sad mask and put on his laughing mask. I have to say, it was a pretty nice moment, and for a brief moment it felt like this session perhaps wouldn't go so badly. All of us united in laughter at the expense of good old Pistonhead. How naive I was for thinking such cute thoughts. As the laughter began to die out, Santini tried to get my attention. He whispered to me across the circle. Hey Doc, is that guy laughing at me? I turned to look at who he meant, and saw it was Blanc. I tried to explain to Santini that it was just a paper mask. But he wouldn't have it, of course. Blanc was laughing at his face. That's how it was. Santini started to yell at Blanc, telling him to knock it off and calling him obscene names. Then he began to strain against his straps, trying to get loose. Two guards immediately stepped up and grabbed his shoulders. It didn't do much good though, as Santini only got more furious by the second. By now, Blanc had jumped up from his chair and stood in a corner of the room, his laughing mask exchanged for a terrified mask. Watson then yelled out to Santini. She called him Flatface. 
He turned away from Blanc to look at her, and found her staring him straight in the eyes. That's when I signaled for all of the guards in the room to hold Santini down. Flat face, she yelled out again, calling him an ugly mother and and then began to laugh. She laughed him straight in the face, screaming how funny he looked. His eyes lit up with so much fury it seemed like they were going to pop out of his skull, while the veins in his neck grew so large they could burst at any moment. At this point a steel cage couldn't have held Santini down, let alone a few meager straps. One by one they all snapped. Now the guards tried to hold them down, they really did, but nothing could stop the bulldozer that was Sam Santini. He gave two of them a vicious headbutt each, while he shoved the remaining three away from him. The two guards outside were already on their way in. Before they could even reach Santini though, he flew across the room and jumped upon the laughing Alice Watson. He gave her furious headbutt after furious headbutt. Her laughter was soon turned into hideous gurgles as her face became unrecognizable roadkill. Meanwhile, Simon Silk found the whole thing hilarious and laughed his ass off. He egged Santini on, shouting for him to get more ferocious. Michael Blanc still cowered in a corner with his terrified mask on, and Axel Breitling finally filled up his tank and went back on the road, kicking the engine into gears again. All seven guards descended upon Santini, smashing him with batons. When that failed to even budge him, they tased him, over and over, until he finally let up and fell to the floor, shaking and flapping around like a fish on dry land. Naturally, I told them to take him and throw him into solitary, for a year. I looked down at Watson's body, her limbs were twitching. But considering the state of her head, there was no way she was alive. Still, I sent for a medical team to take her to the infirmary nonetheless. It didn't do any good, of course. I guess Alice Watson finally got her wish. Maybe now she's finally reunited with her brother. Yeah, I don't think I'm up for another group therapy session for a long time.